of a program uh, change tonight because um, one of our tellers from earlier on uh, couldn't make it to the uh, second show. So we've actually got a blow in uh, Storyteller for you tonight, sharing a story that's never been told on stage before. And so please welcome our blow in Storyteller of the night, Miss Me. I've got to tell a story on my own, um, on own show, so you get to hear it for the very first time. True story, of course. It was the early 90s and my boyfriend Mark and I were on the trip of a lifetime through Malaysia and Thailand. And the highlight of the trip was a three-day trek through Tungan Nagara National Park, the world's oldest uh, tropical rainforest, 130 million years old. We set off at dawn for what was to be that first day of a, a light trek, six to seven hours, to that first primitive hut where we would be spending the night. Mark was carrying not only his own backpack, but also mine, because back then he aimed to please. <laughs> the rainforest, oh, it was so lush. The ground was, was dewy and, and moist, and there was a canopy of, of trees and leaves that kept us cool. Exotic butterflies and colourful birds, and the only sound that you could hear apart from the sounds of nature were the crunch and squelch sounds as we walked along the path. Now the terrain, that was fairly straightforward. There were some logs that needed to be stepped over and there were a few shallow ditches that needed to be traversed, but nothing, nothing too major. We, we could manage it perfectly fine. About two and a half hours into the trip, Mark steps up onto a log and then in slow motion, as these things tend to happen, he somersault and he fell to the ground with a huge crack. And this crack was so loud, it was deafening that there was a flock of parrots that took to the sky and they enveloped the sky. And I just knew by the sound of that crack that as he'd hit the ground, he must have snapped a branch. <laughs> but in fact, what he snapped was his humerus. And the arm lay limp and deformed and it was swelling and it was going black and this part of the bone was pointing this way and this part of the bone was pointing the other way. And from the shrieks and obscenities that come out from his mouth, I knew that it was serious. I had a medical emergency on my hand and with a bone that large that breaks, you know, the body goes into shock pretty quickly. So I had to spring into action. And my first thought was, who's going to carry my bag for the rest of the holiday? I jumped into action. I got the Panadol out of the bag. I got the box of Panadol out of the bag and I gave him the box. Yes, the whole box. I then got out my trusty sarong, the one that went everywhere with me. During the day, it was a skirt and a towel. I lay on it at the beach and at night, it went over my head as a mosquito net. Well, I made this, so this sarong into an amazing sling. I put the arm up here with the fingertips on the shoulder and I immobilised the whole arm. Now this was, no, this was no easy feat to do because it was very, very painful for Mark. And at one point I had my knee on his chest to hold him down while I managed to get the, the sling fixed. And then when I'd done that, I grabbed into my bag and I got my last remaining clean T-shirt and I wiped up the snot and the puke from his face. <laughs> A deep breath, I sat down and I thought, right, what's next? How are we going to get out of here? It's okay, I remember, I ticked the box. Yeah, I ticked the box. I bought the travel insurance. We'll be right. And I remember when I signed up for the travel insurance, that glossy brochure. You've all seen the glossy brochure, right? And on the front cover of the glossy brochure, there's the man in the white tunic and the suit and the stethoscope around his neck and there's a pretty nurse and there's a stretcher with a sick patient. And then there is the ambulance and the helicopter, worldwide travel insurance, whisking them off to the first world treatment at a world-class hospital, right? That's what we sign up for. No, that's not what happens when you're in the middle of nowhere, rural Malaysia. It was a religious public holiday and no one knew that we were there. So I had to go to plan B, which was we'll just have to wait until some other travellers come along the path. About 90 minutes later, we were watching and watching and then we saw two people and I've never been so happy to see two people in my life. 
And as I got closer, realized that communication was going to be a bit of a barrier. My French very limited, their English very limited. But by our gesticulation and the exasperation in my voice, they knew that we needed urgent help. And what we were able to do, we managed to hitch Mark up on our shoulders and we took a shortcut. We went through some dense bush down to the riverbank and there was a river that ran all the way along the National Park. And when we got to the edge of the river, we waved down some local fishermen on a long boat and we gave them some ringgits. We gave them some more ringgits and they took us back to the park headquarters where the ranger drove Mark to the hospital, air quotes, hospital. There were two tin sheds, one for women, one for men. And I was shooed away and I was told, tomorrow, tomorrow, that was the only English this woman spoke. So I left him there for the night. And when I went back the morning, I didn't sleep a lot. When I went back the next morning, Mark had no recollection of what had happened. They had knocked him out with something and he'd woken up with a plaster cast on. Now, think plaster cast, right? This was not the sort of plaster cast that you and I would be thinking of. It was very basic. It was very rough. His arm had been set at 90 degrees oh. and he had the plaster that was covering his uh, fingertips. So this part looked OK. But up the top here, the plaster cast barely covered the fracture. It was all wobbly and there was a big gap at the top. So that meant that every time he moved, the two edges of the broken bone grated against one another and made this awful, awful, awful noise. Now, the problem was we still had a long way to go because our ticket was Perth, KL, Bangkok, London. We'd planned to do this big overland trip in the middle by road, by bus, by train, by ferry. We did not have the money to change that to air tickets and there was no helicopter that was going to be whisking us away for first world treatment. So we had no other option but to continue the journey. So the only way that we were able to get through the journey was by Mark taking taking copious amounts of painkillers, very, very strong mind-altering painkillers, which I might add were pretty easy to get hold of in Malaysia. And for the rest of the trip, I not only carried my bag, but I also carried his bag. And we've now been married 30 years, and strangely enough, He's never offered to carry my backpack again for me. <laughs> but do you know what? I can still make a mean sling out of a sarong if anyone needs first aid. <laughs>